Metamorphosis. Book by Franz Kafka. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1915. This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 1. When Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed right there in his bed into some sort of monstrous insect. He was lying on his back, which was hard, like a carapace, and when he raised his head a little he saw his curved brown belly segmented by rigid arches atop which the blanket, already slipping, was just barely managing to cling. His many legs, pitifully thin compared to the rest of him, waved helplessly before his eyes. What in the world has happened to me? He thought. It was no dream. His room, a proper human room, if admittedly rather too small, lay peacefully between the four familiar walls. Above the table, where an unpacked collection of cloth samples was arranged, Samsa was a traveling salesman. Hung the picture he had recently clipped from a glossy magazine and placed in an attractive gilt frame. This picture showed a lady in a fur hat and fur boa who sat erect, holding out to the viewer a heavy fur muff in which her entire forearm had vanished. Gregor's gaze then shifted to the window, where the bleak weather, raindrops could be heard striking the metal sill, made him feel quite melancholy. What if I just go back to sleep for a little while and forget all this foolishness, he thought. But this proved utterly impossible, for it was his habit to sleep on his right side. And in his present state he was unable to assume this position. No matter how forcefully he thrust himself onto his side, he kept rolling back. Perhaps a hundred times he attempted it, closing his eyes so as not to have to see those struggling legs, and relented only when he began to feel a faint dull ache in his side unlike anything he'd ever felt before. Good Lord, he thought, what an exhausting profession I've chosen. Day in and day out on the road. Work like this is far more unsettling than business conducted at home, and then I have the agony of traveling itself to contend with. Worrying about train connections, the irregular, unpalatable meals, and human intercourse that is constantly changing, never developing the least constancy or warmth. Devil take it all. He felt a faint itch high up on his belly, still on his back. He laboriously edged himself over to the bedpost so he could raise his head more easily. Identified the side of the itch, a cluster of tiny white dots he was unable to judge. And wanted to probe the spot with a leg, but drew it back again at once, for the touch sent cold shivers rippling through him. He slid back into his earlier position. All this early rising, he thought, it's enough to make one soft in the head. Human beings need their sleep. Other traveling salesmen live like harem girls. When I go back to the boarding house, for example, to copy out the morning's commissions, why, these gentlemen may still be sitting at breakfast. I'd like to see my boss's face if I tried that some time. He can me on the spot. Although who knows, maybe that would be the best thing for me. If I didn't have to hold back for my parents' sake, I'd have given notice long ago. I'd have marched right up to him and given him a piece of my mind. He'd have fallen right off his desk. And what an odd custom that is. Perching high up atop one's elevated desk and from this considerable height addressing one's employee down below. Especially as the latter is obliged to stand quite close because his boss is hard of hearing. Well, all hope is not yet lost. As soon as I've saved up enough money to pay back what my parents owe him, another five or six years ought to be enough, I'll most definitely do just that. This will be the great parting of ways. For the time being, though, I've got to get up. My train leaves at five. And he glanced over at the alarm clock ticking away atop the wardrobe. Heavenly Father, he thought. It was half past six, and the clock's hands kept shifting calmly forward. In fact, the half hour had already passed. It was getting on towards 6.45. Could the alarm have failed to ring? Even from the bed one could see it was properly set for four o'clock. It must have rung. Yes. But was it possible to sleep tranquilly through this furniture-shaking racket? Well, his sleep hadn't been exactly tranquil, but no doubt that's why it had been so sound. But what should he do now? The next train was at 7 o'clock. To catch it, he would have to rush like a madman. And his sample case wasn't even packed yet. And he himself felt far from agile or alert. And even if he managed to catch this train, his boss was certain to unleash a thunderstorm of invective upon his head. For the clerk who met the five o'clock train had no doubt long since reported Gregor's absence. This clerk was the boss's underling, a creature devoid of backbone and wit. What if he called in sick?
But that would be mortifying and also suspicious, since Gregor had never once been ill in all his five years of service. No doubt his boss would come calling with the company doctor, would reproach Gregor's parents for their son's laziness, silencing all objections by referring them to this doctor. In whose opinion there existed only healthy individuals unwilling to work. And would the doctor be so terribly wrong in this instance? Aside from a mild drowsiness that was certainly superfluous after so many hours of sleep, Gregor felt perfectly fine. In fact, he was ravenous. While he was considering these matters with the greatest possible speed, yet still without managing to make up his mind to leave the bed, the clock was just striking a quarter to seven. A timid knock came at the door at the head of his bed. Gregor, the voice called, it was his mother, it's a quarter to seven. Didn't you want to catch your train? That gentle voice. Gregor flinched when he heard his own in response. It was unmistakably his old voice, but now it had been infiltrated as if from below by a tortured peeping sound that was impossible to suppress, leaving each word intact, comprehensible. But only for an instant before so completely annihilating it as it continued to reverberate that a person could not tell for sure whether his ears were deceiving him. Gregor had meant to give a proper response explaining everything, but under the circumstances he limited himself to saying, Yes, thank you, mother, I'm just getting up because of the wooden door. The change in Gregor's voice appeared not to be noticeable from the other side, for his mother was reassured by his response and shuffled off. But their brief conversation had alerted the other family members that Gregor was unexpectedly still at home, and already his father was knocking at one of the room's side doors, softly. But with his fist, Gregor, Gregor, he called. What's the problem? And after a short while he repeated his question in a deeper register, Gregor. Gregor. Meanwhile, at the other side door came his sister's faint lament. Gregor? Are you unwell? Do you need anything? Just a second. Gregor answered in both directions at once, making an effort, by enunciating as clearly as possible and inserting long pauses between the individual words. To remove anything conspicuous from his voice. And in fact his father returned to his breakfast, but his sister whispered, Gregor, open the door. I implore you. But Gregor had no intention of opening the door. He praised the cautious habit he had acquired while traveling of locking all his doors at night, even at home. First he would get up calmly and undisturbed, he would get dressed and above all have breakfast, and only then would he consider his next steps for all these supine contemplations. He suddenly realized, would yield no useful results. He recalled often having felt mild aches and pains in bed, caused perhaps by lying in an awkward position, and this pain had then proven to be a figment of his imagination the moment he got up. He was curious to see how this morning's imaginings would gradually fade. The change in his voice was nothing more than the harbinger of a proper head cold, an occupational hazard among traveling salesmen, this he doubted not in the least. It was simple enough to rid himself of the blanket, he needed only puff himself up a bit, and it fell right off. But the rest proved difficult, not least because he was so exceedingly wide. He would have needed arms and hands to prop himself up, but instead all he had were these many little legs, variously in motion, that he was unable to control. If he tried to bend one leg, it would be the first to straighten, and when he finally succeeded in getting one leg to do his bidding, all the others went flailing about in an unnerving frenzy. Enough of this lying about uselessly in bed, Gregor said to himself. At first he tried to maneuver the lower part of his body out of the bed, but this lower part, which, by the way, he had not yet seen and couldn't properly imagine, proved too unwieldy. It all went so slowly, and when at last, half mad with impatience, he thrust himself recklessly forward with all his strength, it was in the wrong direction, and he slammed against the lower bedpost. The throbbing pain he felt instructed him that for now at least the lower part of his body was perhaps the most sensitive. So he decided to try leading instead with his upper body and carefully twisted his head toward the edge of the bed. This was easily accomplished, and in the end, despite his width and weight, the mass of his body slowly followed the turning of his head. But once his head was dangling in midair outside the bed, he was afraid to keep shifting forward like this, since if eventually he had to let himself fall in this position. It would be practically a miracle if his head escaped injury. And right now he had to keep his wits about him at all costs, even if it meant staying where he was. But when, 
Sighing after redoubled efforts, he found himself lying there as before, watching his little legs engaged in their struggles, perhaps more flailingly now, and seeing no possible way to bring calm or order to this chaos. He told himself once more that he could not possibly remain lying here any longer and that the most sensible thing would be to sacrifice anything and everything as long as there remained even the slightest hope of liberating himself from the bed. Simultaneously, though, he continued to remind himself that calm consideration, indeed, the calmest consideration, was far preferable to resolution seized on in despair. At such moments he fixed his eyes as sharply as possible on the window, but regrettably the view of the morning fog, which failed even the far side of the narrow street. Offered little by way of optimism and good spirits. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself as the clock struck once more, already seven and still such dense fog and for a little while he lay there quietly, his breathing shallow. In the expectation, perhaps, that this perfect silence might possibly restore the real and ordinary state of things. Then he said to himself, before it strikes a quarter past seven, I must absolutely have gotten myself completely out of bed. Besides, by then someone will have come from the office to inquire after me. As the office opens before seven, and he now set himself to rocking his body out of the bed as evenly as possible along his entire length. If he allowed himself to fall from the bed like this, his head, which he intended to lift up cleanly as he fell, would in all likelihood remain unharmed. His back seemed to be hard. Surely it would sustain no damage as he fell to the rug. His greatest concern was what to do about the loud crash that would clearly result, no doubt calling forth not terror perhaps but certainly alarm behind each door. Nonetheless, it would have to be ventured. By the time Gregor was already protruding halfway out of bed, this new method was more a game than a struggle. All he had to do was keep rocking sideways a little at a time. It occurred to him how simple things would be if only someone came to his aid. Two strong individuals, he was thinking of his father and the maidservant, would suffice. All they'd have to do was slip their arms beneath his curved back to scoop him out of bed, then crouch down with their burden and wait patiently for him to flip himself over onto the floor, where he hoped those tiny legs of his would take on some meaning. But even aside from the fact that the doors were locked, should he really call for help? Despite his distress, he couldn't help smiling at the thought. Already he'd reached the point where the vigorous rocking motion was making it almost impossible for him to keep his balance, and soon he would have to make up his mind and take the plunge. For a quarter after seven was only five minutes away, when the front doorbell rang. It's someone from the office, he said to himself, and nearly froze while his little legs went on scrabbling all the more frenetically. For a moment all was still. They won't answer, Gregor said to himself, caught up in some deluded hope. But then of course, as always, the maid strode resolutely to the door and opened it. Gregor needed only hear the visitor's first words of greeting to know who it was, the general manager himself. Why oh why was Gregor condemned to serve in a firm where even the most negligible falling short was enough to arouse the greatest possible suspicion? Was every last one of the firm's employees a scoundrel? Was there not a single loyal, devoted soul among them who would be driven mad by pangs of conscience should he fail to make the best possible use of even just a few morning hours for his employer's benefit, such that his guilt would render him virtually incapable of rising from his bed? Would it really not have sufficed to send an apprentice to inquire, if indeed such inquiries were necessary at all, did the general manager have to come in person? And was it necessary to demonstrate to the entire innocent family that the investigation of this suspicious matter could be entrusted only to the general manager's sharp intellect? And more because of the agitation aroused in Gregor by this train of thought than because of some proper resolution on his part, he swung himself out of bed with all his might. There was a loud thud. You couldn't really call it a crash. The rug cushioned the impact a little, and since his back was more elastic than he'd thought, the resulting sound was muffled and not so obvious. But he hadn't managed to hold his head up carefully enough and had bumped it. He turned it this way and that, pressing it against the rug in his vexation and pain. Something just fell in there, the general manager now said in the room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine whether anything like what he was now experiencing could ever befall the general manager. The possibility must certainly be admitted. But as if brusquely dismissing the question, the manager now took a few purposeful steps in the next room, making his patent leather boots creak. From the room on the right came the whisper of Gregor's sister informing him 
Gregor, the general manager, is here. I know, Gregor murmured. But he didn't dare raise his voice high enough for his sister to hear. Gregor, his father now said from the room on the left, the general manager has come to inquire why you failed to depart by the early train. We don't know what to tell him. Besides, he'd like to have a word with you in person. So please open the door. I'm sure he'll be kind enough not to take offense at the untidiness of your room. Good morning, her Samsa, the general manager now cried out in a friendly tone. He isn't well, Gregor's mother said to the general manager while his father was still having his say beside the door. Not well at all, take my word for it. Sir, why else would Gregor miss his train? The office is the only thing that boy ever thinks of. It really bothers me that he never goes out in the evening. He's been back in the city an entire week now, but he's spent every last evening at home. He just sits at the table with us, quietly reading the newspaper, or else studies the timetables. Even just doing woodworking projects seems to entertain him. He carved a little picture frame, for example, did it in two or three evenings with his fret saw. You'll be amazed how pretty it is. It's hanging there in his room. You'll see it in a minute when Gregor opens the door. Oh, and I'm so glad you paid us a visit, sir. On our own, we'd never have managed to persuade Gregor to open up. He's so stubborn. And surely he isn't well, even though he denied it this morning. Be right there, Gregor said, not moving, so as not to miss a single word of their conversation. No other explanation, madam, is conceivable to me, the general manager said. Let us hope it is nothing grave. Though on the other hand, I would note that, as businessmen, fortunately or unfortunately, as one will, we are very often obliged to suppress indispositions out of consideration for the firm. So are you ready to let the general manager in? Gregor's impatient father asked. Knocking again at the door. No, Gregor responded. In the left-hand room, horrified silence, while in the room on the right, Gregor's sister began to sob. Why didn't his sister go to join the others? She must have just gotten out of bed and not yet begun to dress. And why was she crying? Because he wasn't getting up and opening his door to the general manager, because he was in danger of losing his position. And because his boss would then start hounding his parents once more over their ancient debt? For the time being, all such worries were assuredly unnecessary. Gregor was still here, and abandoning his family was the farthest thing from his thoughts. At the moment, to be sure, he was lying on the rug, and no one familiar with his current state would seriously expect him to let the general manager in. But surely he wouldn't be sent packing just like that because of so trivial an act of discourtesy, for which it would be simple enough to find an appropriate excuse later on. And it seemed to Gregor it would be far more sensible to just leave him in peace rather than disturbing him with all this weeping and cajoling. But the others were distressed by the uncertainty of it all. Their behavior was understandable. Her Samsa, the general manager, now called out, raising his voice. What has come over you? You barricade yourself in your room. You reply to queries only with yes and no. You cause your parents onerous, unnecessary worries. And you are neglecting, let me permit myself to note, your professional responsibilities in a truly unprecedented manner. I speak here in the name of your parents as well as your employer and in all seriousness must ask you for a clear and immediate explanation. I am astonished, utterly astonished. I have always known you as a calm, sensible person, and now it seems you've begun to permit yourself the most whimsical extravagances. To be sure, the boss did suggest one possible explanation for your absence this morning. It concerns the cash payments recently entrusted to your care, and truthfully. I all but gave him my word of honor that this explanation could not be correct. But confronted here with your incomprehensible obstinacy, I find myself losing any desire I might have had to come to your defense. And your position is anything but secure. It was originally my intention to discuss all this with you in a private conversation, but since you compel me to waste my time here. I do not know why your esteemed parents should not hear of it as well. In short, your productivity of late has been highly unsatisfactory. Admittedly, this is not the best season for drumming up business. We do acknowledge this. But a season in which no business at all is drummed up is something that does not, and indeed may not exist, her Samsa. But sir, Gregor cried out. Beside himself and forgetting all else in his agitation, I shall. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.